Good. Thank you. The uh, final argument set for this morning is State of South Dakota versus Mark Waldner and Michael Waldner, uh, Jr. Uh, arguing for the appellants will be uh, Jeremy Lund and Chelsea Wenzel. I understand you'll each argue 10 minutes your initial and then uh, five minutes each on rebuttal. And then uh, appearing for the uh, defendant Mark Waldner is Kent Lair and uh, Timothy Whalen's appearing on behalf of Michael Waldner. And I understand, Mr. Whalen, you're going to be arguing for both defendants. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. So with that, uh, who's going to start? Mr. Lund? All right, go ahead. May it please the court, counsel. We are here today because the defendants in a child sex abuse case wants to read the victim's diaries after they have already received her medical records, her psychological records, and one of her diaries, and shared that information with an internationally closed religious society. The first issue before the court is whether this court has jurisdiction over an appeal from a victim in a criminal case. I submit to the court that there are two lenses under which this court can evaluate jurisdiction for an, an appeal of this matter. The first lens is that of a subpoena issued to a non-party. That is, pretend it's not a victim that's been subpoenaed. The other lens is looking through the lens of a victim in applying Marcy's law. Under the first lens, just a non-party who's been subpoenaed. The standard for the quashing of a subpoena ducis tecum is set forth in 23A.14.5. It establishes that a subpoena can be quashed if uh, unreasonably, if unreasonable, uh, or oppressive. In the Red Book, there is only one set of cases that applies, or that is in the entire publication, and that is the Milstead cases. The Milstead cases are actually rather interesting in how this court proceeded. Because there was no prior precedent, for appealing from a subpoena ducis tecum for a non-party. The sheriff, Milstead, in that case, took a scattergun approach. They first filed a notice of appeal. They then also filed a petition for intermediate appeal. When this court granted the petition for intermediate appeal, it dismissed the notice of appeal, which indicated to the country, or to the state of South Dakota, that the appropriate jurisdictional a method of attaining appellate jurisdiction in that scenario was a petition for intermediate appeal. In the event this court were to say that this is appeal of right, uh, Marcy's law is, provides the victim the right to exercise and to enforce her, their rights in any appellate in order for a victim to enforce their, their rights in an appellate court, they must have the ability to appeal. Marcy's law also sets forth that the victim's rights must be protected as vigorously as a criminal defendant's rights. Now, in a criminal, in a criminal case, the, typically the state and the defendant are set with the uh, appeal statute of 23A 3212, which sets forth that for any, any order by the circuit court that is not determined to be an appeal of right, it is to be done by intermediate appeal. That means that if you are going to enforce the, or if you, if you are going to enforce the uh, victim's rights to the same level as you would the defendant's rights, then the victim has a constitutional right to an intermediate appeal at minimum. The so, so because of that statute just says the state and the defendant as it currently reads, are you suggesting that we still 
superimpose the constitutional provision there and, and read victim into that in a scenario where you don't have the state advocating for the victim? Well, it creates a very interesting dichotomy. Because under Marcy's law, the victim doesn't have to hire their own attorney. The state can, in, can seek enforcement of the rights as well. So under that statute, if the victim doesn't hire their own attorney to advocate on their behalf, the state's remedy is an intermediate appeal. So to keep continuity, this court is required to provide a remedy through the due course of law. And the due course of law means a remedy that already exists. So in this context, in a criminal case, an intermediate appeal is the appropriate jurisdictional, uh, the minimum uh, jurisdictional event, uh, means. And if this court were to determine that a victim or a third party, uh, a non-victim non third party, has an appeal of right as opposed to a petition for intermediate appeal, I would direct the court to state, or Rapid City versus State. In Rapid City versus State, the appellant in that case was challenging an order changing venue. The court's prior case law indicated that it was an appeal of right. However, in the very last paragraph, I believe, the state, this court stated that the state properly followed our prior precedent. And although we decided that is not a, an appeal of right, but, in, but a uh, discretionary appeal, the, uh, we will treat their, their notice of appeal as a petition for intermediate appeal. So if it's an appeal of right um, per the constitutional provision, the, that provision doesn't lay out the procedural mechanism for an appeal of right. So we still would have to look to a statute with regard to the time for filing, uh, what needs to be filed. So what is your thought there? Well, Justice Devaney, the time frame for an appeal of right for a notice of appeal is 30 days whereas the petition for an intermediate appeal is 10 days. But we would apply the civil <coughs> procedural, the 1526A provisions for the 30 days? Because there are, there are statutes in the criminal procedure code in 23A32 that set forth time frames for appeals of right, but this doesn't seem to, to fit within any of those either. So, so then we look to 1526A? I would agree with that. And that creates another, that brings up another relevant issue, is the state joined in the petition for intermediate appeal one day late. Now the defense has argued that because they are one day late and that the victim does not have an independent right to appeal an intermediate appeal, that that somehow deprives this court of jurisdiction. However, under 15, 26A92, this court has the authority to extend any deadline other than a notice of appeal. Could we consider, finish your thought, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. That's fine. <laughs> no, but I've done it. Could we, would it be easier in this particular case, and maybe it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, apply more widely outside the context of what we have here, which is a, uh, a motion to quash a, a subpoena proceeding, but could we determine that that proceeding, which there is some support to suggest, maybe that's, that's more civil in nature, and it does seem like it's, a, it's final as to that issue, could we construe that to be a special proceeding? This determination by the circuit court here then would be a final determination in a, in a, in a special proceeding, uh, and then there would be a question about whether it impacts substantial rights, and we could have a non-criminal appeal, if you will, under the provisions of 1526A3, subsection 4. Your Honor, I don't, I don't disagree that you could. However, I would point the court to, again, the Milstead versus Smith case. And on the intermediate appeal, they granted the intermediate appeal based on subsection 2. But that wouldn't impact the result. 
No. There, there would still you, be jurisdiction one way or the other. You would find jurisdiction. Well, what it would require is us to interpret the petition as a notice of appeal. And there's some non-compliant, maybe a, appeal, there's maybe some, some distinctions between the petition and the notice of appeal, but that's in the dash four rule, not in the dash three statute. Correct. As it relates to the actual, the court's determination to order an in-camera review, we submit to this court that the victim has an absolute privilege to not disclose information or <coughs> produce discovery pursuant to a defendant's request. There are no exceptions to the right to refuse a discovery request. How do, how, I, I understand you're right with regard to the express language of the constitutional provisions. We have uh, other cases, and in particular, this court has addressed the Nixon case and the test, which I assume you'll be, you or co-counsel or state's counsel will be talking about. But how do we reconcile the concept of this is an absolute right with um, with the the considerations that were made by the U.S. Supreme Court case when considering the similar issue and an alleged right that also at least had constitutional underpinnings and still found it necessary to, to balance those rights with the defendant's um, rights, constitutional rights as well uh, in the judicial process. Justice Devaney, are you referring to Pennsylvania versus Ritchie? No, I'm referring to Nixon, United States okay. versus Nixon. So the difference between this case and Nixon is that the claim of pr presidential privilege versus a constitutionally provided privilege. And it's important to recognize that the presidential privilege actually dates back to the case of United States versus Aaron Burr. Uh, and in that case, they didn't really explain why or to what extent there is a presidential privilege. But as a judicially derived privilege, the court, the Supreme Court, had the leisure to define whether or not the requested information or the scope of such a privilege, because it's always going to be subject to the United States Supreme Court in the development of the case law. In this particular context, we aren't dealing with a judicially created uh, privilege. I will give you an example of when it comes to the... Uh, you, the need to, you need to wrap up the answer to your question. Okay. You have a chance on rebuttal, too. But. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Justice. The minister privilege doesn't have any exceptions. We don't create exceptions to privileges that are not set forth in the text. This court cannot judicially create an exception. Instead, in order to circumvent a privilege, it must follow United States Supreme Court case law that, hold, that would hold that the privilege uh, would deprive them of their constitutional right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wenzel, you may proceed. May it please the court, counsel. The state agrees that the Constitution in this case provides a right to appeal. However, I would like to address the statutory right to appeal. You had brought it up, Justice Salter. It is the state's position that SDCL 1526A3 subsection 4 does provide um, a right for appeal in this case. And that statute allows an appeal from any final order affecting a substantial right in a special proceeding. Um, this case falls squarely within that statute according to this court's analysis and in the in Ray summons case and the cases cited therein. In that case, this court noted that a motion to quash is civil in nature or similar to a civil case. If we look at SDCL 15.1-1, that statute defines what an action is and what a special proceeding is. An action is an, order, is an ordinary proceeding where one party is prosecuting the another, another for um, the enforcement or determination of a right or for the punishment of a public offense. Everything else is a special proceeding. Now, while the proceedings in this case having to do with the subpoena were ancillary to a criminal proceeding, 
They did not involve the arrest, charge, or punishment of a public offense. Therefore, a motion to quash and the proceedings involving the motion to quash were civil. Um, as you indicated, Justice Salter, this would be a final order, certainly as far as the subpoena duces tecum is concerned, and it does affect the substantial rights of EH, that is her right to privacy under the South Dakota and United States constitutions. And here I think EH's petition should, can and should be construed as a notice of appeal. Um, there is no limit in the statute as to who can appeal in that case. In an abundance of caution and as explained, um, by counsel, each did apply or petition for discretionary review. But the time limit for a discretionary review and the information that is needed, uh, or the time limit is shorter and the information that is required is more. Of course, you, you file them with a different court. So the notice of appeal would get filed with the circuit court, a petition with this court. So what do we do with that difference? I. I don't think that would make a difference in this case. Um, I think here it's very clear, and the, the title of the pleadings, the form of the pleadings, um, the fact that it was filed, that, excuse me, the title and form of the pleadings is not, or should not be elevated over the substance. And that's what this court has said. In fact, in SDCL 1526A4, it says the only thing that's jurisdictional is the filing in a timely manner. So. I interpret that to mean that failing to file the docketing statement or anything like that would not be jurisdictional. So here it was still filed and served in the requisite amount of time and the important information was there. Um, again, title and form should not be elevated over substance. Are you going to address the absolute right issue or the, the Nixon factor issue? Yes, ma'am. So we agree that this is an absolute right um, looking at the language. What in makes Marcus it absolute? Law. Looking at the language, maybe you're going to get to that. What what markers do we do we do we have that suggest this right is absolute? There are very few absolute rights. What suggests that this one's absolute? First, the language of the Marcy's Law statute. It says a victim has a right to privacy, which includes the right to refuse an interview, deposition, or other discovery request. There's no exceptions. For How instance, does that differ fundamentally from, let's say, the Sixth Amendment right of confrontation that says a, a defendant has a right to of confrontation? at trial, and there are no exceptions. And yet the cases are legion in recognizing that it is not absolute. And that in fact, a defendant, as we see from the Milstead case and the Carlin cases and other cases, we know very much uh, the case that, that the Sixth Amendment right of confrontation, just for instance, though it contains no exceptions, is not absolute. Why would this one be absolute? And why would the text alone suggest it's, it's absoluteness? When we look at other privileges, for instance, statutory privileges, there are exceptions. And I think that is what indicates that those privileges, for instance, are not absolute. And here we can also look to other um, constitutional provisions in other states that also have this similar Marcy's Law language. In those constitutions, they provide exceptions, or they say, for instance, uh, the section may is not intended and may not be interpreted to supersede a defendant's rights. We don't have any of that language. Do you see a difference between a right to privacy, a right to, to not have an interview, and something that's known as a, as a privilege? Is there a difference or not? I would say no. I would direct this court to SDCL 1919-501. And that defines what a privilege is, and that is defined as a right to refuse to disclose or produce materials. And it also recognizes that a constitution can, or the constitution can afford a privilege. And here, when we look at the language, the Marcy's Law provision, it specifically says a, that the victim um, may refuse a discovery request, so may refuse to disclose. So it is a privilege under how our statute defines privilege. So even if we read that as an absolute right under under Mercy's law, how does that interplay work with the federal constitution that guarantees certain rights? And so even if we say, okay, this is absolutely a right under South Dakota constitution, does that ever yield to the rights under the federal constitution? Or are you saying it doesn't ever? I think it possibly could. We know that the United States constitution is the supreme law of the land. So I do think that a federal constitutional right can supersede a state constitutional right. And if this court were to hold in that way, um, then in that situation, the court must, the lower court must apply both the Nixon factors 
and a constitutional balancing test, and I would say the correct constitutional balancing test. Because you really don't know if, if, if these rights are on a collision course yet until you really determine whether the information that's sought is a material part of a defense. Yes, Your Honor, and that, I mean, it, there is some overlap between the balancing test and the Nixon factors, and what that requires is that um, the person issuing the subpoena has to make a showing, right? We have factors. It has to be, the evidence has to be, or they have to make a showing that it is relevant and material, that it's possibly or probably admissible, and that it's requested with adequate specificity. Um, here, uh, the subpoena deuces tecum sought to compel a rape victim to provide all documents, pictures, videos, um, electronic records, journals, uh, a long list of things over a 13-year period that spanned both before and after the allegations in this case. Um, that is entirely too broad. I mean, especially when you're looking at requesting something with adequate specificity and making that showing. Um, here the court, the trial court concluded, they didn't apply Nixon, but they relied on Davis and Ritchie, and they concluded that the defendants met their burden to show that the evidence exists and that there's a need to access EASA's journals. That is far below the required showing in Nixon. The fact that they exist and that the defendants in good faith have said that they need these materials is not enough to overcome, I mean, certainly it's not enough under the Nixon tests or the Nixon factors, excuse me, which do apply to anything, whether it's um, privileged or not, but it's certainly not enough uh, when a constitutional right of the victim is involved here. Um, well, even um, aside from the specificity, what in the current record before the court um, established the relevancy prong with respect to whether or not what type of information was being sought and whether it was likely that it would be found in these documents that were being requested? The record in this case is actually very lacking. Um, there was arguments of counsel, but there is nothing in the record to support the court's findings in this case. So, for instance, the court found that the journals reveal certain matters relevant to EH's mental health. There's nothing in the record um, defining what, what in that journal would have been relevant. In fact, the trial court did not review the journal before making that finding. The journal is not in the record, the one journal that has been disclosed. Um, the trial court also found that each suffers from mental health conditions that may have an impact on her general credibility. Um, other than arguments from counsel, there's nothing in this record suggesting that any mental conditions she might have um, would affect her general credibility or that um, any mental health conditions would be able to be used to attack her credibility because there are limited reasons. With, with regard to the record, it appears the parties all stipulated to supplement the record with the one page from the journal um, that I think the defense was relying heavily upon. Um, and is it, I have not seen anything else in the record. Is, is that the only journal page of the one that was turned over that is currently in the record? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, and then I would like to move on to the balancing test that you were asking about, Justice Devaney. Uh, if the Nixon factors are met, there still must be a constitutional balancing in this case. And even when we look to the Nixon case, that's the same thing the court did there. They first looked at the factors, and then they looked at the constitutional privilege that was asserted. And there the court said the assertion of a general constitu constitutional privilege must yield to the demonstrated specific need for evidence. That's fair. Um, but how do we apply that? I would direct this court to state B counts. There's a balancing test in there. And there, um, the court required the defendant to show a specific constitutional need for the evidence. That the defendant had to show why, in view of everything else that they had been offered or everything else that had been discovered, why the, why the uh, evidence in that case was specifically necessary under the Constitution, not just why it would be helpful. Then when um, those fact, or that information can then be balanced against uh, victims' rights, um, for instance, or, and excuse me, balanced against the intrusion on the victim's rights. The worse the intrusion, the higher the specific need must be. I see my time is up. Thank you, Ms. Winston. Mr. Whalen, you may proceed. Good morning. May it please the court and counsel. Uh, this morning, as I was preparing to here, uh, 
looking in the mirror, wondering how much work I needed to put on my hair, I decided that uh, this isn't that overly complex. I think it's been blown way out of proportion as to, um, in the sense that it has been, it's been an analyzed and there's been a number of arguments that have been presented that distract away from the key issue. On the jurisdiction, you either have jurisdiction or you don't. You cannot create it out of thin air. The arguments made by the, the state and uh, EH in this, they asked the court to go through a humongous gyrations to get to the point where now we have jurisdiction. You don't have jurisdiction here, period. If you want to argue that there's jurisdiction, as Justice Salter uh, questioned, under 15-26A-3, uh, I believe it's subdivision four, four or two, whatever it is, um, it indicates that under special proceedings you can do you can have jurisdiction under um, uh, circumstances where an order affects substantial rights. Fine, I'm not conceding the issue, but let's say that I'm wrong and and that that applies. There's no notice of appeal filed. There's no docketing statement filed. There's no compliance with the rules of appellate procedure. So you can't go there to acquire. Well, the petition has a lot of the same information. Why couldn't we use that? Because it's inappropriate. Because the law requires a notice of appeal filed in a timely fashion. It requires that it have the appropriate judgment or order attached to it. And it requires that a docketing statement be filed. But and the they law, don't have that. But the law that you're talking about, perhaps, is a reference to 1526A4, which is, I believe, not a statute, but rather a court rule. Court rule statutorized by the legislative function. What's that, I'm sorry? It, it, it's a statute that's been legislatively enacted. It's now law. Uh, it was a rule. It's now the law. Four is a statute. The dash four, 1526A dash four is a statute. Right. If it appears in the red book, she's the law. That's my that's my conclusion. It I may have been created. That. It may have been created by by the Supreme Court, but now it's the law. We go to the law to find out what our procedure is. And consequently, since it's, it's in the law, it's in the books, there it is, um, it, it's required to be complied with. Even if it is a court rule, it's still required to be complied with. Mulligan, in Mulligan, this court dismissed an intermediate appeal because the defendant didn't comply with the rules governing intermediate appeals. That rule is no different for the state and EH. They have to comply. We can't create exceptions, excuses for non-compliance. And how about City of Rapid City versus State? City of Rapid City was a special circumstance because the law had changed and, and uh, actually the procedure had changed as a res in term during the pendency of the matter and the, uh, the uh, appealing, par appealing parties didn't have an opportunity to fully comply with it because they followed that judicial determinations before, uh, at the time that they filed their appeal. And the court said, we're going to cut you some slack on this because of the circumstance. That isn't the case here. There was no change being pent in the law pending, and there was no circumstance that they needed to accommodate. Unless the law we, was clear. Un unless we find jurisdiction under 1526A3, subsection 4, which, as Mr. Lund points out, would be different than what apparently was the jurisdictional basis in the Milstead cases. But if you, if you go that route, and, and, and assume jurisdiction because of the, the circumstances described in subsection 4, you still need a notice of appeal. You, you still have to comply with the rules. You can't excuse filing of a notice of appeal. Mulligan specifically says you have to timely file. And there's no law or case out there overruling Mulligan. So in Mulligan, this, this issue that is, was raised by Mr. Lund, I believe that the 1526A92 the ability of this court for good cause to extend periods of time. Um, that, that wasn't brought up, that wasn't raised in Mulligan. Why would that not be an avenue here? And I'm talking about the intermediate appeal process okay. that was followed in Milstead, which is the, seems to be the exact same thing that the victim did here. Okay. Um, 92 doesn't cut it, because 92 specifically says in the last sentence, Except to accept as to the time for filing your notice of appeal. But this isn't a notice of appeal. It. This is a petition for intermediate appeal. Time frames are still time frames. You can't modify the time frames based upon a statute when the law clearly says you have to comply 
with the time frames for filing. Mulligan says you can't extend the time for filing a notice of intermediate appeal. Mulligan says that. Milstad, in Milstad, both Milstad cases and uh, uh, both Milstad cases, uh, they never argued the time issue. They never argued whether or not there was a procedural defect. They never argued jurisdiction. So doesn't the state have a right to rely upon uh, that and the parties a right to rely upon the fact that that vehicle uh, was used in, in Milstead? They would, and co that would, that's the argument and the leap that the state makes and EH makes to get back to the Rapid City case. But there was no change in the statute pending, nor recently made. When, what what, what year the, was the statute with regard? change that you're referring to in Rapid City, that, that wasn't my read of the case. I thought that there had been a number of issue, opinions issued um, despite the statute having been changed, and that was the reason the court determined that because it had essentially not, not evolved like the statutes um, had with its prior decisions. I believe that was a timeliness. I believe it was the timeliness statute governing the, the appeal in Rapid City, and they said, well, look, we enacted that, or it was enacted. No, it was whether or not you had an appeal of right versus you had to take a discretionary appeal. And then that was that, the issue. It was not a timeliness issue. Okay, but the difference is if you have a, a discretionary appeal, then you have 10 days to file it. If you have appeal of matter of right, it's 30 days. So if, if that's the, the, if I remember correctly, and I may not, but I, if I remember correctly, that was the issue that caused the problem was the timeliness of the file because of the change in the statutes. And so they allowed a transitional. Well, I, yeah. I, I'm not going to argue with you about that. That's okay. my read of it. But, um, but it was a reliance on the type, whether it was an intermediate appeal or a notice of appeal of right. I agree with you it was a reliance issue. But the argument was that, that I'm making is that Rapid City is a special circumstance and it is not something that you can rely on to say, I don't have to comply with current filing on appellate matters. And, and I don't believe that Rapid City grants that authority. I think Rapid City was a special circumstance. We don't have a special circumstance here. There was no issues. Everybody knew what the law was. There should have been timely filing of that, of that uh, appeal. And if you look at the, time, the filing of the petitions for intermediate appeal, they still don't comply with the rules regarding timeliness, and they don't comply with the rules governing um, content of notice of appeal. And so for those reasons, I don't believe that the court has jurisdiction. Secondly, I don't believe that the Marcy's Law creates jurisdiction. And I don't believe that some, something that hasn't been addressed, I don't believe that Marcy's Law is self-executing as argued by the state in their brief. Marcy's Law gives a general right to a victim where they can participate in matters involved in their criminal prosecution or the criminal prosecution involving them. It doesn't set forth any rule. It doesn't set forth any time frames. It grants the right. And the difference in self-executing constitutional provisions and non-self-executing is that there must be, there has to be in order for it to be self-executing, some rules or some procedures established. Marcy's Law simply says you have a right as a victim to be involved in prosecutions at uh, court, uh, the trial court level as well as the appellate court level. And EH was, and EH still can be. If the state had properly pursued the petition for intermediate appeal, EH could have filed a brief. EH could have been actively involved in that. That's what Marcy's Law says was in, in the criminal prosecution at trial court. Does EH have a right to be involved? Absolutely. Does EH have a right to assert her rights? Absolutely. And she was afforded that right. But Marcy's law doesn't say you have a right to file appeals and you have to and, and you have a certain time frame. It doesn't say that you can be a party to appeal an issue. It doesn't say that. It says you have a right to be involved and participate in trial level and appellate level. You file a, a brief in a, the appeal court, you're participating. You have an attorney. Counsel, before you run out of, out of time here, can you please address whether or not you think it was an error for the circuit court not to um, apply the Nixon factors with regard to your subpoena ducas tecum before ordering the records produced to the court? In the opinions uh, authored by Justice Kern, uh, Milstead decisions, that addressed directly the issues associated with the Nixon test and Carlin and address both those issues. I don't believe the trial court erred. 
in the manner in which it addressed in, uh, the facts associated with this case. I, I see nothing in Milstead or Carlin that says that the uh, uh, subpoena ducus decum rules, the Nixon test, applies to every subpoena ducus decum carte blanche. Those cases specifically de dealt with statutory privileges and privileges that were recognized in the law. We don't have a privilege here. There were no privilege. If you look back at Milstead and Carlin, they all dealt with a privilege that is recognized in the law. Here, the privilege that EH is arguing is that I have a constitutional provision that allows me to do X, Y, and Z. They've conceded that there's no privilege here. They've conceded that issue. Well, I, that's not what I heard in, in counsel's argument referred to we have a statute that defines a privilege uh, that refers to a right to fuse discovery, which is what this constitutional provision, or excuse me, the constitutional provision actually says. They conceded it in their brief. They conceded both the state, the state conceded it in argument in front of the trial court, and they were specifically addressed whether or not there was a uh, privilege here, and they denied it. They said no. And uh, EH uh, conceded that issue in her brief where she said there is no privilege as defined by the law. The privilege they're arguing is it's, she has a right under the Constitution, and that's her privilege to not disclose these things. Does that, that matter? I mean, and that's the question I had to, to Ms. Wenzel. I mean, does it, does it really matter, or is it rather a matter of, of semantics if we say someone has a privilege, common law or, or otherwise, or they have a right to maintain privacy if they assert that right in the context that we have here, which is I don't have to talk to people, I don't have to give you my things. And that's what I say my right is. Does it matter whether we call that a privilege or a right, in this case derived from the Constitution? I think it does, Justice Alter, because I think a privilege is something that is less than a right. I think a privilege is recognized in the law, and I think a privilege allows you to do certain things, but your actions are, are more easily used and recognized to waive the privilege than to waive a right. Well, if it's less than a right, then that might suggest that she has stronger expectation to maintain her privacy than if she just had a common law privilege. But it's a legislative function to create that privilege, not a judicial function. And the court can't create a privilege that is recognized the equivalent of the attorney-client relationship of the doctor-patient of the uh, uh, employment records that are recognized in the law of the, uh, those types of privileges. They're recognized in the law. I don't think the court can create a privilege. I think the right that they're suggesting is the one that was created by the voters in Marcy's law. Correct, but that doesn't say that that right is absolute. And it doesn't say that the court can't consider evidence to determine whether or not the access records. Um, but doesn't that lead you right back to Nixon and Justice Devaney's question? That's where I'm going. On Nixon, we look at it, we need to know whether it's relevant, we need to know whether or not it's potentially admissible, and we need to know whether or not there's specific, ad uh, adequate specificity for the documents. <clears throat> In this particular case, <clears throat> if you read the DCI report that is what supplemented the record, you'll see at least a half a dozen or more references to the specific nature of the claims EH is making. You'll see that there's a reference to a purple journal. You'll see there's reference to other journals that Adam and Levi, who accompanied EH on every interview with DCI, you'll see that they have read those journals, or some of them. You'll see that there's a stack of journals. You'll see that she makes reference to... Um, so I just want to make clear, you're referring, there's one page currently in the record. Yes. Where I, in that page is that information no, no. you're just referring to? You're correct, Justice Devaney. There is just one page from the journal. But if you look at the DCI report, it makes specific reference to the dates of entries in that journal that was disclosed. And the DCI report details and quotes from that journal. Okay, so we don't need the whole journal in because we have the DCI report that makes specific quotation references on date of entry. You'll see when you look at so, that DCI report. So where in the DCI report or the page of the journal that's in the record does it um, support your suggestion that all, the, there are all these other journals or diaries, if they exist, also talk about the allegations in this case? Because she, she in the DCI report, if I recall reading it correctly, she makes comments that she has addressed this, these, this, this horrible circumstance in her journals. And Adam and Levi, 
both tell the DCI agent that they've read journals, specifically the Purple Journal, that, sit, that talks about the allegations that have occurred in this case. The, the reference to the Purple, it's actually a reference to a Purple notebook in the page that's in the record that uh, refers to poems that she wrote that were disturbing. That's the only description in the page that's, that's in the record before us that refers to what might be in that particular notebook. Right. She does call it a purple notebook, but a notebook, journal, Well, diaries. I'm getting more to what, what, it, what was referenced to be in it, which was a, a notebook containing her poems. So how, how from that do you get to a determination that there's a bunch of other journals out here that must contain information about what happened in this case. I believe if you review the DCI report, the DCI report from those entries that are quoted talks about her, her discussions, if you will, with her journal. And so she makes reference to how she's expressed herself in the journals, and I believe either Adam or Levi uh, recommended in the DCI report that she make journals about this particular incidence these incidences. And so I think in the DCI report, because not only does she talk about um, all the things that she, not all, but the things that happened with the rape, the alleged rape, she also talks about her other journals and that how she is dealing with this by doing the journaling. Was the circuit court provided more from the DCI report than what you supplemented the record? With? I believe I, the I, circuit court was provided with the DCI report, and I believe the circuit court took the journal. But I believe the circuit court took the journal we had. Have, is it relevant? Her discussions, she has been diagnosed, and there is actual testimony in the record about the diagnosis from Dr. Meter that shows her, her mental status. She's prone to fantasy, prone to fabrication. She hallucinates. She, she, she doesn't have a complete touch of reality. And that goes directly towards her credibility on whether or not she fantasized these circumstances. Our clients are pleading 100% not guilty. There's no physical evidence that connects them to this. There's no DNA. There's no witnesses. There's nothing. But there's complaints about these particular events, the rapes occurring in the kitchen area, in the church area, at the mechanic shop, at all hours of the night and day, at the Hutterite colony where their freedoms are fairly severely restricted as to hours of when they can be in the church, when they can be in the, in the kitchen. So you have those things that are necessary in order to consider. And then we look at whether or not the items in the journals will be admissible. I don't have to show that they're definitely admissible. I have to show that there's a, there's a possibility that they could be admissible under Nixon. And then there's the specificity. How specific were we? We asked for journals and diaries from January 1 of 2010 to the present. There's clear evidence, I believe, that the journaling had occurred on a regular basis both before and after these incidents occurred. Now, the uh, allegations that haven't been completely flushed out because we haven't had a trial, the allegations indicate that this was an ongoing assault, that there's several charges against my client, for instance, and there's several charges against um, Mr. Lear's client. And those charges stem from repeated incidences, not one that occurred on Janu during the month of January or during the year of 2014. There, there isn't any of that. The, 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 evidence shows thus far that these were repeated occurring uh, circumstances occurring over a, uh, a fairly lengthy period of time. I argue that the court sufficiently addressed the Nixon issues in findings of fact 13 through 15, 21, 22. They addressed the waiver issue and the burden that the defendants had met their burden at conclusion of law 6 and 8. And I think under these circumstances, there's clearly been a showing under Nixon. Could the findings of fact and conclusions of law address that issue a little more? Yes, they could have. But that's not a remand or a reversal. That's at best a remand for the circuit court to straighten out its findings of fact. I believe there's more than enough evidence in the record for that. So I think, Your Honors, under these circumstances, there clearly is, if we consider the overall argument and the purpose 
of constitutional rights, the balancing of defendants versus Marcy's law. In this case, defendants have to proceed, uh, supersede. Okay, thank you, Mr. Whalen. Uh, Mr. Lund, you may proceed with uh, your five minutes. In, Mr. in the defendant's uh, argument, the question was asked, does the federal constitution ever override a state constitutional privilege? It can. But the procedure is not through Nixon. Rather, the procedure is that you must determine that it is infringing on a constitutional right. Throughout their brief, throughout this oral argument, they have not raised a constitutional right that they say is being infringed upon uh, by them not getting access to the victim's journals. The Constitution guarantees criminal defendants a meaningful opportunity to present a complete defense. But the United States Supreme Court has also recognized that state and federal rule makers have broad latitude under the Constitution to establish rules excluding evidence from criminal trials. Only rarely have we held that the right to present a complete defense was violated by the exclusion of defense evidence under a state rule of evidence. That is a quotation from Nevada versus Jackson. The only time the Supreme Court of the United States has ruled that a state rule of evidence violated a defendant's constitutional right is when it was arbitrary. The rules are arbitrary when they cannot be supported by a rational basis for which they are enacted. Well, that's why I, I talked to Ms. Wenzel about this, or I, I noted, at least as I just was thinking out loud, there may be a, a sequence issue that, that we have here. In other words, we wouldn't even, and I'm not suggesting that depending upon the Nixon outcome, you know, then, you, then you've implicated the, the due process right to complete defense or not, but that seems like it would be closer. But we're not there yet, right? So how far ahead can we, we get? I mean, that, that, has to, that has to play out. Would you agree? I would agree. Yes and no. What I would submit to this court that the issue pre before it is whether or not she has a constitutional privilege and whether or not her privilege has been violated by the court's order. If it's privileged without a exception, then you, ha you don't even get to Nixon. Nixon doesn't apply if there's a privilege. Nixon, in Nixon itself, the United States Supreme Court says, yeah, you don't have a privilege over all your communications. You have a privilege over state secrets and military. You don't have a privilege to all your communications. I think your argument suggest something that's been lurking in the background of this case uh, and in the circuit court all along. And that is something I described earlier as a possible collision course. I'm not sure it is a collision course, really. This idea that one, uh, a victim's rights have to predominate over a defendant's rights or vice versa. Is it really that way? In other words, in other words could a defendant assert rights to privacy and a defendant assert a right to com a complete defense if that was a righteous claim, and they could coexist. They I couldn't. They, co they couldn't coexist in a criminal case, but they could coexist. Which is to say, a victim could say, "I'm not giving you anything." Now, I suppose if push came to shove, a judge could say, "I think that the right to a complete defense is presented here and is implicated here, and without that information, there's a due process problem," and the judge could. What? Dismiss the indictment? I don't believe that's, that's the way that works. Relevance of the defense, it does not mean they're deprived of their, of their rights. Because well, I agree with that. The right to confront and cross-examine does not include the right to cross-examine in any way, shape, or form you want. It must it's not absolute. Now, I will direct the court's attention to Pennsylvania versus Ritchie with the limited time I have left. 
Pennsylvania versus Ritchie rejected the premise that uh, the, the non-disclosure of child support or child uh, protection records violated the confrontation clause. They said that the only way, it would only be been impermissible for the judge to have present, prevented Ritchie's lawyer from cross-examining the daughter. In that same case, they also rejected the reliance on Davis. Ritchie was, found, was based on Brady. Brady only applies to evidence in the possession of the state, and if it's not in the state, you cannot extend Ritchie beyond the facts of that case. Counsel, I have a, a question regarding the record. Um, did the court take the journal back uh, into chambers and review it? it, it Unfortunately, Your Honor, I was not on the trial level at the time. I cannot speak to that. Um, is the same true with reference to the DCI records? Were additional DCI records considered below that are not part of the record before us? Considering the, the defendants needed to supplement the record with a DCI record now, I, that to me suggests that it was not previously reviewed. Thank you. May I ask one question? Go ahead. Just to clarify. So is your argument then because you're invoking Brady and, of course, constitutional violations depend upon state action, right? Is your argument then that information solely within the possession of a witness, victim, non-state actor takes us outside the realm of constitutional violations? It certainly takes it outside the realm of Pennsylvania versus Ritchie and the in-camera review there done to ensure that exculpatory evidence in the possession of the state was not disclosed to the defendant. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Wenzel, you may proceed. So I apologize, I might jump around a little bit, but I do want to address some of the questions the court has asked. Um, first, Justice Savannah, you've you were talking with uh, defense counsel kind of about the accusations in the case and whether there's anything in the record suggesting that the other journals talk about accusations. I don't believe there is anything in the record, and I would, um, I guess I would assert that any journals that were written before the accusations occurred certainly don't talk about the application, or certainly don't talk about the accusations. Here, this is a 13-year time span nine years before the accusations in this case arose is what um, the defendants are asking for and what the court ordered. Uh, my reading of the record, I, I was not counsel um, below, my reading of the record is that the trial court judge did not review. In that last motion hearing on March 28th of 2023, um, in reading that, I would, there's nothing that makes me think that he did review the journal. Um, and the court also talked about what they did review, and that was the DCI report uh, that was offered at the previous hearing and the journal, the one page of the journal that had previously been put into the record by the defendants. Um, and the defense counsel had said that the findings inclusion can, excuse me, the findings and conclusions, even if they aren't good enough, that there's enough in the record to show relevance. Um, first, I would say that the findings and conclusions are certainly not enough um, and, in fact, applied the wrong test. And in that scenario, it is appropriate for this court to remand for um, the application of the correct test and findings and conclusions. Here, again, the circuit court uh, concluded that the defendants met their burden to show that the evidence existed and that there was a need for access to each as journals. That is the exact conclusion um, that was rejected by the Ritchie case the case that the court relied on for this. I mean, there's nothing in the court's conclusions that's supported by law or by the record. With, with regard to that, you, you just mentioned something about a remand. Well, the, whether or not the three, three hurdles that, as Nixon referred to it, have been met, those are matters of law that the court would determine based on the existing record, would they not be? Whether there's relevancy, specificity, and admissibility whether that has been shown. I think it could be, but here we don't have the record to support that. Um, and the findings, again, go, or the findings and what's in the record would, I guess, establish that. And when I say remand, 
I'm not saying that the defendants can't make another showing. Maybe they can at a different time. I think, Justice Salter, you had mentioned that maybe this is too soon. Um, <clears throat> here, the showing has not been made, and that's why it would need to be remanded. There's not enough stuff in the record. There is a lot of discovery in this case. Um, but the point is, with this record, what the court concluded is not supported by the record. I also think that at this time, um, any other, I guess, any other interpretation or any anything else but a remand or this court saying that um, the defendants didn't meet their burden would be wildly inefficient. Here, the defendants haven't even explained what would be relevant to her, to her mental health. They haven't explained exactly what they're looking for in the journals. So to ask the circuit court to go through 13 years worth of journals to try to figure out what may or may not be relevant um, is not an efficient use of the court's time. And again, that's why the showing is required, is so the court has something to look for. Um, and finally, I just wanted to um, touch on the balancing test again. I think it absolutely is appropriate to apply a balancing test here. Um, Justice Salter, I think you had asked, can't the constitutional rights coexist? They absolutely can coexist, and that's why we have this balancing test. Yes, a defendant has constitutional rights. They absolutely do. But it, those are not absolute either. So I think, again, I would point the court to the state v. counts decision. I think that balancing test, um, the facts are a little different, but I think that balancing test is appropriate. Um, and this is something, this balancing test, as um, EH's counsel brought up, this balancing test is something we do, uh, or something that courts do, whether an evidentiary rule infringes on a weighty interest, right? You have to have a weighty interest, and then we look at the purpose of the rule. Um, the same kind of thing here. Defendants have to show a constitutional need. And I think with everything else they've provided, they've not been able to show that anything that they claim is in these journals would be anything but cumulative of what they already have. They have all of her medical records, her counseling records. What could be in these journals that's going to tell them about her mental health better than her mental health records and her counseling records? Until they make that showing, they have not um, made the showing that would entitle them to the journals in this case. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you counsel, for your arguments uh, this morning. Uh, th this will uh, conclude uh, our oral arguments for the March term of court here at Northern State University. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to, first of all, publicly thank uh, uh, President Schnorr and, and the uh, staff here at Northern State University, the students, for their hospitality. We, we appreciate the opportunity to to come and, and uh, do our work uh, here in the public in the northeast part of the state. Uh, I also want to express appreciation to the South Dakota Highway Patrol. Uh, they provide security um, the last several days, and uh, we're grateful for their, uh, for their help. Um, our law clerks who are seated over here at, uh, to our right, um, they do a, a ton of work in terms of getting us prepared for these terms, both for the oral cases and the non-oral cases that we hear and I appreciate all their uh, good work and assistance to us. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Lisa Bausa, who is, who is our public information officer. has been here the last couple of days helping us out. And, and finally, uh, Shirley uh, Jamison Fergal, uh, the clerk of court. Uh, honestly, uh, she puts all of this together, and, and she's going she's gonna to say that's not true, but uh, she... Uh, did a lot of work to make this uh, come together for us, and uh, we're uh, really grateful, Shirley, for your uh, your assistance. Uh, with that, uh, the court is in uh, recess. Thank you.